Okay, so we'll begin. Let me share the screen. Everyone can see the screen, yeah? You got the PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we're going ahead to chapter number 10, but let's quickly review lesson 9, the main features of lesson 9, chapter 9 rather, the most confidential knowledge. So it began with the importance of hearing about Krishna, and Lord Krishna told us about the qualification and disqualification, right? You remember, first of all. There were two, actually, two main things. Do you remember? Yes? What were they? Yes, it, Hare Krishna, can somebody tell me what its qualification, first qualification was? The first verse? To be non-envious. Right, to be non-envious. And then another important qualification was? Faith, right. In the third verse it talks about faith. So, so those two things were mentioned, the, the particular qualification, disqualification. Then the chapter goes on to speak about Lord Krishna's uh, relationship with the material world, right? Although he's in everything, but still he's not attached to everything, he's aloof from everything. So he's a chincha beda beda relationship. That while the the whole world is him, he's aloof from it all. It's all his energy, but he's aloof from it. So that was the second section. And then we heard about uh, non worshippers, particularly it was described about the jnanis or the mayavadis, who think of the the universe as being, think of themselves as being one with the universe, that they are the universe practically. So they were the non-worshippers. And then we heard about the worshippers, the Mahatmas, the great souls, who are engaged in chanting and worshipping the Lord with great determination and bowing down before Him. They're always chanting the glories of the Lord. And then we went on to hear about how Lord Krishna is the supreme object of worship and he's worshipped by people who may worship the universal form. And we heard also about uh, how the, the devotees worship Lord Krishna how they offer everything to him and how Krishna reciprocates with them. Because they're giving everything to Krishna, Krishna wants to reciprocate with them. And then the, we hear about the glories of directly worshipping Krishna. We heard about offering fruit, flower, leaf, water with love and devotion. Krishna wants the devotion. He's not worried what, so much what we offer, but he wants the, the devotion, the mood, is what matters to Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna, we heard about yoga kshema baham yaham, that Krishna carries what we like and preserves what we have. And then after describing about offering a, fr a leaf, fr flower, fruit and water, then there's the karma yoga verse. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer and give away, as well as all austerities, they should be done as an offering to Krishna. So that's karma yoga rather than bhakti yoga. And then we heard about how even the sinful person is 
protected by the grace of Lord Krishna, that even a sinful person, he quickly becomes righteous and he attains lasting peace because he's properly situated in devotional service, even though he may have some faults, he may have some accidental fall down or something, but he will greatly lament it and he will rectify himself and Krishna says he he quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. And Krishna said, my devotee will never perish. So Krishna gave that promise that his devotee would not perish. We also heard about how even people of lower birth, they can all achieve the supreme destination. And we heard how Krishna is equal to everyone, but he has a special interest in his devotees. So those were the main points from the ninth chapter. Very, and now all the chapter finishes, of course, with the, the, the most confidential knowledge that we can worship Krishna by engaging our mind in thinking of him and offering obeisances and worshipping him him with love uh, and becoming his devotee. Those four things, four things that's considered the most confidential knowledge. So that was the end of the ninth chapter. So we're going to go on over here from the tenth chapter. At the end of this lesson, the student should be able to explain the value of knowledge of Krishna's Vibhuti Yoga with reference to 10th chapter, 1st verse, 7th verse and 18th verse. So the, this 10th chapter is called the op Opulences of the Absolute. The Sanskrit word is Vibhuti Yoga. So we'll hear about the value of knowledge of Krishna's Vibhutis in this chapter. And we want to be able to explain the significance of Krishna's opulences. Listed, many opulences are listed, I think it's about 80, 86 or something, opulences are listed, verses 19 to 42, we'll hear about Lord Krishna's opulences. And then we will also present points relevant for personal application from the Chatur Sloki Bhagavad Gita. So tonight we'll have a look at the Chatur Sloki Bhagavad Gita, which is made up of these four verses, uh, the 8th verse, ninth verse, 10th verse, and 11th verse. So just as there are four Chatur Sloki, there's the Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam, which comes in the second canto, ninth chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, so the Acharyas have pointed out there are four verses in the Bhagavad Gita which are like the Chatur Sloki of the Bhagavad Gita. So we'll look at these tonight. So those are the main points. We're going, oh, one more. Seeing Krishna everywhere. We've seen something of that phenomena in the seventh chapter verses 8 to 12, and it's also brought out here in the 10th chapter, again in the same section with the Vibhutis, Chap chapter 10, text 19 to 41, we'll hear about how we can see Krishna everywhere from the Vibhuti. So these are the objectives we want to try to achieve tonight, we'll go ahead. All right, so the chapter begins with uh, an under, we want to understand Krishna's nature and how we want, we want 
want to understand Krishna's nature and by understanding Krishna's nature we will naturally be inclined to engage in his devotional service. So this will be brought out at the beginning of the 10th chapter. Lord Krishna had covered uh, the most confidential knowledge and described his relationship with his devotees and the importance of directly serving Krishna in the ninth chapter. So now in the tenth chapter he begins by describing that when we properly understand Lord Krishna's nature, when we have a, a good understanding of Lord Krishna's uh, position, knowledge of him, then it will be natural for us to engage in his devotional service. Then we will go on to hear the Chatur Shloki of the Bhagavad Gita and that will be followed by Arjuna's acceptance and request to hear more of Krishna's opulences. After Arjuna hears Lord Krishna speak the Chatur Shloki of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is inspired and he offers glorification of Lord Krishna and he praises Lord Krishna and he asks Lord Krishna to speak more of his opulences and so that will come up in the rest of the chapter. So those are the main points of the chapter, 10th chapter. Uh, here's the first section. One who has understood Krishna's unfathomable nature engages in his devotional service. From Prabhupada's purport of the first verse, Now Krishna is instructing Arjuna in more confidential knowledge of his opulences and his work. Previously, beginning with the seventh chapter, the Lord has already explained his different energies and how they are acting. Now, in this chapter, he explains his specific opulences to Arjuna. In the previous chapter, he has clearly explained his different energies to establish devotion in firm conviction. Again, in this chapter, he tells Arjuna about his manifestations and various opulences. So this is the first verse of the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Does anyone have any questions so far? Everyone's okay with what we're doing? Yes, much. Okay. Just let me see, I just want to open this. Okay, so the first chapter begins with a discussion about Bhagavan. I'll just read the first verse. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Listen again, O mighty armed Arjuna, because you are my dear friend. For your benefit I shall speak to you further, giving knowledge that is better than what I have already explained. So Krishna always encourages this, he's going to give more knowledge, going to explain more knowledge. So yeah, would someone like to read this please? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Unless one is firmly convinced of the different opulences of the Supreme Lord, 
he cannot engage in devotional service. Generally, people know that God is great, but they do not know in detail how God is great. Here are the details. If one knows factually how God is great, then naturally he becomes a surrendered soul and engages himself in the devotional service of the Lord. When one factually knows the opulences of the Supreme, there is no alternative but to surrender to him. This factual knowledge can be known from the descriptions in Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita and similar literatures. Thank you. So Prabhupada's making the point. When many people will say like that, oh yes, God is great, but how great is he? That they don't know. If you ask them to describe, can you tell me about his great... They don't know. Very hard for them to speak anything. Yeah? A little more, Prabhu, just to finish this. This is from the seventh verse of the tenth chapter. Okay. When one is firmly convinced of them, he accepts Krishna with great faith and without any doubt and he engages in devotional service. All this particular knowledge is required in order to increase one's interest in the loving devotional service of the Lord. One should not neglect to understand fully how great Krishna is, for by knowing the greatness of Krishna, one will be able to be fixed in sincere devotional service. Bhagavad Gita 10.7. Thank you. All right, thank you. So you can see the mood here in this first section of the 10th chapter. In the second verse, Lord Krishna describes how even the demigods and great sages do not know Krishna's origin or opulences. Lord Krishna says, in every respect, I am the source of the demigods and sages. And so they, they cannot understand the mystery of Lord Krishna's birth. It's bewildering. We know how Lord Brahma was bewildered when he saw Lord Krishna playing the part of the cowherd boy in the fields, holding the butter in his left hand. And Brahma was thinking, this is my master. It was very difficult for him to understand the Lord. So, Lord Krishna is describing how important it is for us to understand, to know about the glories of the Lord. And he stresses this in the third verse. He says, in verse number three, he says, he who knows me as the unborn, as the beginningless, as the supreme Lord of all the worlds, he only, undeluded among men, is free from all sins. So Lord Krishna, by speaking like that, he's encouraging all of us to understand about the, his own position. What is his position in this world? We want to worship Krishna, we should know something about him. Sometimes you get people, they're, they're chanting Hare Krishna, they don't know anything. So then verse 4 and 5, Lord Krishna lists many different qualities, various qualities of living beings, and Krishna says, they're all created by me alone. So many different qualities intelligence, knowledge, freedom from doubt and delusion, like the control of the senses, control of the mind. It's all, these are all qualities which are created by Krishna. Everything comes from Krishna, right? The good and the bad, they're all created by Krishna. Krishna has the front side, he has also the back side. So the bad qualities come from the back side, like that. But everything is coming from Krishna. We want to be convinced about this. Then we can properly worship Lord Krishna with devotion. Without proper understanding, then our devotion will not be fixed. Okay, then Krishna goes on, text number six, to describe the seven great sages and before them, the four other great sages and the manus, or progenitors of mankind, come from me, born from my mind. And all the living beings populating the various planets descend from them. So this way Lord Krishna is establishing how everything comes from him. Of 
course, in a few verses, in the next verse, Lord Krishna will confirm this. Because the next verse will be, Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo. Famous verse, Krishna said, I am the source of the material and spiritual worlds. Everything comes from me. So text number seven, he's saying the seven great sages and the four other great sages, four other great sages, meaning the, the four Kumars, and the seven great sages, meaning the, the sons of Brahma, like that. These, diff, these are all the different uh, people. Lord Krishna said, they all come from Him. And they're all born from Krishna, come from my mind. So look, everything comes from Krishna. When we properly understand Lord Krishna's position, then certainly we will worship Him with devotion. Text number seven, Krishna says like that, one who is factually convinced of this opulence and mystic power of mind engages in unalloyed devotional service. Of this there is no doubt. So this is the first section of the tenth chapter. Lord Krishna is stressing the importance of having good understanding of Lord Krishna's opulence and his powers and his energies. And this way then we can be firmly fixed in devotion to Him. Oh. Okay, let's go ahead. Coming to the next section, 8 to 11, the Chatur Sloki of the Bhagavad Gita. Right? So the first verse of the Chatur Sloki, everyone chant. Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo Mata Sarvam Pravatate Iti Madhva Chante Ma Buddha Bhava Samavita All right? Perfectly knows his engagement. In my devotional service. And worship me with all their hearts. And worship me always for all the heart. So significant words. Buddha, the learned, right? Not everyone knows this. The wise, who those who are learned, they will know this. They will perfectly know this and they will engage in devotional service and worship Krishna with all their hearts. Buddha Bhava Samanvita, Bhava Samanvita, with great attention, right? So Lord Krishna had spoken about this in the previous verse, text number seven, he's spoken about yoga. He's spoken about yoga, so he was, he, Lord Krishna said in number seven, he said, those who are convinced of this opulence and mystic power of mine engage in my unalloyed devotional service. So we see the devotees say they're engaging in bhakti yoga. That is the yoga, devotional service. And they're convinced about Krishna. They're factually convinced of this opulence. So, how do they know? Because, Aham Sarvasya Prabhu Mata Sarvam Pravartate. Right? Krishna says, He is the source of everything. It's all coming from Him. This is Lord Krishna's opulence. Everything emanates from Him. Oh, so when we're convinced of that, then we will, will certainly we will worship Krishna with this bhava samanvita, with great attention. Right? Prabhupada translates it, he says, worship me with all their hearts. When, our, when we're really attentive, then we'll put our heart into it. We'll really try our best to worship Krishna properly. We'll want to do it. Worship Krishna. 
properly. So this is the first verse of the Chatur Shloki. And this is describing Sambandha Gyan. Right? There are three different levels of Gyan described in Bhagavad Gita. There is first of all Sambandha, which is knowledge of the relationship. And then there's Abhidaya, which is the process, knowledge of the process, Abhidaya Gyan. And then Prayojana, the goal of the process. Prayojana Gyan. So this Chatur Shloki begins here, this is the Sambandha Gyan. Lord Krishna is describing his relationship with the material energy in the material world. Not only that, the spiritual energy also. He said he is the source of everything. It all comes from him. So the intelligent people they will engage in Krishna's service and worship Krishna very carefully. So this is the eighth. Krishna Maharaj? Yes? Um, can I ask a question, Maharaj? Right oh, now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm looking at the purport of 10.8. Uh, in the purport, Prabhupada referred a couple of Upanishads. One of them is uh, Maha Upanishad and there is another Upanishad, uh, Narayana Upanishad. It is mentioned that uh, from Narayana, Brahma is born, and from Narayana, Indra is born, eight Vasus are born, and from Narayana, the eleven Rudras are born, and Aditya sir. So how do you understand? Because from Bhagavatam, uh, Rudra is born from, the eleven Rudras are born from Lord Brahma. Right? And also in the, in the next paragraph also, according to Maha Upanishad, Lord Shiva was born from the forehead of Supreme Lord. So, how do we understand these statements, Maharaj? Well, it can vary according to the particular time. You see, in different yugas, different uh, kalpas, it can vary. Sometimes, Brahm, they may be born from Brahma, but in that particular Upanishad which is quoted, they're all described as coming from Narayan. So it, it's, it can be like that. It can be just describing in another kalpa. Oh, okay, okay. I'll also, I heard that sometimes if there is no qualified person for the position of Brahma, Vishnu himself takes the position of Brahma. So from that context, they are like, you know, born of Vishnu. Can we understand like that also? I it's possible, yes, certainly it's true that if there's no qualified person for the position of Brahma, the Lord Himself will take the position of Brahma. So that's a possibility, we could think like that. Thank you, Maharaj. Yep, uh, you can see Prabhupada's giving a lot of uh, scriptural evidence there to support this information. The son of Devaki, Krishna, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayana Upanishad. Hmm. And so the... Hare Krishna Maharaj, in the same first paragraph, the last line is given that Narayana is an expansion of Krishna. Yes. That is, that is also mentioned there. So that would be the answer. That Narayana is the expansion of Krishna. Yes, Narayana. And then, what? How did? How do we explain that about the uh, Shiva, that he is coming from Narayana, and, and that uh, all the other different personalities they are also coming from Narayana. Well, he's the original, right? He's the original. Yes. Lord Brahma comes from Narayana. So, the, if, if it's, it, the, you can say that uh, he's, the, he's the original source because ultimately he's the source of Brahma. And then they come from Brahma, but where does Brahma come from? Brahma comes from Narayan. So it's Narayan who's the source of everything. Right? It's fine.
Oh, later on in the purport, proper quotes, in the Mahapanishad, it is also said that Lord Shiva was born from the forehead of the Supreme Lord. Oh, uh, so here, Maha Upanishad said, the Lord Shiva was born from the forehead of the Supreme Lord. But we, of course, we know that Lord Shiva was born from uh, Lord Brahma. Well, that was actually Rudra who came out from the forehead of Lord Brahma. But this is actually, this is Lord Shiva, this is a little different. Well, Rudra, there's different Rudras, we know, we heard about that Rudra which came out from the forehead of Brahma. He was always angry. Anyway, it's, the Vedas say, the Supreme Lord, he's the creator of Brahma and Shiva, who is to be worshipped. We don't worship other gods, we simply worship the Supreme Lord. So this is all Sambandha Gyan, understanding the position of the Supreme Lord and relationship to all the different other personalities and living entities and the material energy and the, the, the material world. So this is the first statement of the Chatur Sloki. And then Oh, we have a quote. Yes, someone like to read the quote for us? I am the only. Wait, wait. Come on, don't fight. Just do it. Yeah, I am the origin of everything. Everything means the universe also. Whatever you can imagine that comes within the category of everything. So, if Krishna is the source of everything, then if you love Krishna, you love the universe. Actually, that is so. If you love your father, then you love your brother. If you love your country, then you love your countryman. So, the love begins from the origin. If you love your body, then you love your finger. Iti matva bhajantema. One who has understood this fact, that God is the origin of all emanations, one who has understood this fact very nicely, scientifically, then by loving God, you love everything. And Bhava Saman Vidaha, Buddha, one must be very well versed at the same time, completely absorbed in spiritual emotion, Bhava. This Bhava is the very highest platform for coming to the perfection of life. Lecture uh, given Bhagavad Gita 10.8, New York 67. Okay, so Prabhupada's quoting the eighth verse there, Buddha Bhava Samanvataha. He's talking about Bhava, spiritual emotion, right? That is, that's the perfection of life, to come to that level of devotional service, to experience that Bhava, that devotional service in ecstasy. So Buddha, ba Buddha one must be well versed. We have to know. We have to understand about Krishna. That's why it's important for us to study like this Bhakti Shastri and to go through the scriptures and study them carefully and know what is being explained. At least we should know something. Of course, we can never know everything about Lord Krishna, but we should know something. We should get the basics right. So this is Buddha and then Baba, we want also that loving emotion, that feeling for Krishna. So this is the mood. Then going on to the next verse, this is the Abhidaya, describing the process of devotional service. We can chant together. Machata madgata prana bodayanta parasparam the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, their lives are fully devoted to my service, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss from always enlightening one another and conversing about me. So you can see that activities which are being described here. 
So this is the Abhidaya, the process of Bhakti Yoga. First of all, the mind has to be there. We have to be thinking of Krishna. There has to be that thought of Krishna in our mind. And we have to be devoted to Krishna's service. We want to give ourselves fully to the service of Krishna. And we feel also the, the bliss and the satisfaction from discussing topics of Krishna. That's also very important for us. We want to be able to, we, we, we have to take pleasure in hearing about Krishna. Mm. So, katayantas chamam nitya. Chamam nityam, right? Nityam, that means always, we, we really, we're always discussing topics of Krishna. That is the sign of a really good devotee. They're always speaking about Krishna, and they're always telling us something wonderful about Krishna. We want to take advantage of that kind of association. Or we want to be, we want to give that kind of association to others. Whatever we know, whatever we've realized about Krishna, we want to share it with people. And we should be eager to t discuss Krishna. The, that is the mood of devotional service. So that is being described here in this ninth verse, discussing topics of Lord Krishna. And then the other two verses are both on Prayojana. Right? First one, we'll chant together. Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam pratipurvakam tadami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upayanti te. To those who are constantly devoted to me, worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So this is an important verse, often quoted. We have to understand it carefully. Who can come to Krishna? Who is Krishna going to give the understanding by which they come to me? You know, we often get people who come along, they say, Krishna spoke to me, Krishna came to me last night and he told me everything. You know, you get these people. So, we have to know how to deal with this kind of argument. And where is this explained in the Bhagavad Gita? <coughs> so here, in this particular verse, Lord Krishna is describing who he talks to. Right? Who does he talk to? Who does he give the understanding to? Krishna gives the understanding to those who are constantly devoted to serving, to serving with love. So, they have, somebody's going to, if somebody's really going to come and speak to Krishna, to the devotee, that devotee has to be a very, very serious devotee. They have to be really in Krishna consciousness. They have to be very active and devotional service. Right, described here. Satatam yuktanam, tesham satata yuktanam. So constantly engaging. And priti purvakam, with love. They have real love for Krishna. So then Krishna says, buddhi yogam tam, yena mam, I give the understanding so they can come. Krishna speaks to that kind of person. He doesn't just speak to anybody, but he speaks to those who are really devoted to him. Prabhupada explains. Yes, someone read? When a person knows the goal of life 
but is addicted to the fruits of activities he is acting in karma yoga when he knows that the goal is krishna but he takes pleasure in mental speculations to understand krishna he is acting in jnana yoga and when he knows the goal and seeks krishna completely in krishna consciousness and devotional service he is acting in bhakti yoga or buddhi yoga which is the complete yoga this complete yoga is the highest perfectional stage of life bhagavad gita 10.10 purport hari krishna so Prabhupada in this statement here, he's describing for us the different levels of yoga, right? Karma yoga, we're addicted, we're attached to the fruits of activities. So that's karma yoga. We still have some attachment for the fruits of action. But he knows what is the goal of life, but we're just attached. We want to enjoy the fruit, we want to work. We want to have the results, but we know what the goal is, so that's karma yoga. And then jnana yoga, we have pleasure, mental speculation to understand Krishna. Hmm. We, we enjoy speculating, trying to understand Krishna. And when he knows the goal and seeks Krishna completely in Krishna consciousness, that is devotional service. And Prabhupada said, or Buddhi Yoga. So Buddhi Yoga is non different from Bhakti Yoga. Because in both cases they know what the goal is and they're completely in Krishna consciousness. They're endeavouring for the perfection. So that is the highest stage. All right, there's another statement. Someone read, please. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Preeti Purvakam with love. Not only that officially you love, then he'll talk with you. Buddhi Yogam Radhamitam. He'll give you intelligence. He'll talk with you because he is within your heart. Simply you have to qualify yourself talk with Krishna. Then Krishna is not far away. He is within your heart. Otherwise, he is very, very far away. If you want to understand by your intelligence, what intelligence have you got? You have to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead by your service and then he will reveal himself. Here I am. What do you want? That is the process. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita 13.3, Bombay 1973. All right, thank you. So Prabhupada stressing these points. Priti Purvakam, there has to be the love, there has to be the genuine feeling to love Krishna. And then, then he will talk with you, give you intelligence. But you have to please Krishna. And how do we please Krishna? We can't just simply say, oh, I love Krishna. We have to show our love to Krishna by service. Then he will talk to you. Then he may say, what do you want? But you have, we have to show our genuine love for Krishna. We have to be willing to give, to give ourselves up to Krishna, to do what Krishna wants. We have to really qualify ourselves. We can't cheat Krishna. We can't just only lip service. Oh, Krishna, I love you. No, we have to. Sh we have to show that real feeling to Krishna, that we're very determined, and we're ready to tolerate all the difficulties, to do whatever is required for the service of Krishna. So that is important. Another quote from Prabhupada's purport this time. Please read someone. A person may have a, may have a bona fide spiritual master and may be attached to a spiritual organization. But if he is still not intelligent enough to make progress, then Krishna from within gives him instructions 
so that he may ultimately come to him without difficulty. The qualification is that a person always engage himself in Krishna consciousness and with love and devotion render all kinds of service. He should perform some sort of work for Krishna and that work should be with love. If a devotee is not intelligent enough to make progress on the path of self-realization, but is sincere and devoted to the activities of devotional service, the Lord gives him a chance to make progress and ultimately attain to him. Yes. This is a, a very important purport from the, the tenth verse of the tenth chapter. Often quoted, Prabhupada is explaining a situation which is quite common that we may have a, a spiritual master and we may be a member of a spiritual organization, but somehow we just we're not making enough, we're not intelligent enough to make progress. And then what happens? Then Krishna from within gives him instructions so that he may ultimately come to Krishna without difficulty. And Prabhupada explains what is the qualification. The qualification is that he's very serious in his Krishna consciousness. He's always engaged in Krishna conscious activities with love and devotion. So like that Krishna is attracted where there is loving service. Nothing can conquer Krishna but the mood of loving devotion. So if a devotee has that mood, then he will attract the mercy of Krishna. If the devotee is not intelligent enough to make progress, but is sincere and devoted to devotional service, Krishna gives him a chance and ultimately attain to him. So this is very important for us. Okay, so we're going to have a, some group work now on these things, give you a chance to discuss. How many people do we have here in the class today? Maharaj, uh, 20, 24, 25 people. Okay. All right. So, uh, there's one... Okay, there's one, two, three, four questions here. Oh no, three questions. There's only three questions. Three questions, right? First of all, the one question is, I believe that by helping people in distress, one can always be in communion with God, for God always cares for those in need. Secondly, by studying and analyzing various literature, I am in constant communion with God. What is the necessity of service or devotion when he is beyond the senses? And thirdly, some people say that God speaks to them directly, therefore they do not need any guru for guidance. All right, so we want you to, let's make five groups, about five people in each group. Divide into groups, discuss how you would reply to the following statements made by people who are not necessarily impious. In other words, these are pious people. They could be pious people, but they're speaking like this. How are you going to deal with them? You can't just blast them and say, you atheist, you rascal. You know, they're, they're pious people, they've just been influenced by some false propaganda. So, we, you can go into groups and discuss how you deal with these three different situations and come back and we will discuss and consolidate this, focusing as far as possible. In your discussion, focus as far as possible on this verse and purport. This verse meaning 10th chapter, 10th verse. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. I'm creating the group, Maharaj. Yes, please.
மத்தவ சேவா இஸ் மா மானவ சேவா ஆக்சுவலி வித் காட்ஸ் சர்வீஸ் வி டூயிங் சர்வீஸ் டு அதர்ஸ் ஃபார் சேரிட்டி தட் இஸ் த பெஸ்ட் திங் So some people is thinking of uh, why I am doing Manava Seva, I don't need to service of God, that is not good. Mm. Yeah, basically by, by serving, so like Yashmin to Shriya Krishna, if we can please Krishna. Recording in progress. probably i could uh, like uh, i don't know whether this has been covered in exactly in the way or not but you know as oprakash prabhu said that uh, you know, those who are the gyanis they think that we read about the lord and you know we talk about the lord so the gyanis so those who are in knowledge so they think that uh, since we are doing all this then why do we need to serve the god but in the yes. light of 10.10 you know the lord says those who are devoted to me serving me with love right So that means those who are engaged in devotion sir recording in progress
the satwa guna. So that looks like we have to go beyond the satwa guna for the siddha satwa. We we have to come to the stage of siddha satwa to understand. Otherwise, only through guru's eyes only we can see Krishna. Mm, yeah, that that's the one about the the third group of people who say yes, that sir. because uh, living entities are uh, uh, having four defects. We have studied about the four defects. Sir. Yeah. But the guru is the one who is not having any defect. Mm. He is the uh, like uh, in uh, samsara dava also there is uh, the point. Uh-huh. Because the guru is a surrendered soul, so you need a surrendered soul to 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 liberate you. If we are, if we 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 if we say we don't need guidance, then as as uh, Prabhu mentioned just now, we have uh, four defects. Then how we are going to liberate ourselves? Yes. How are we going so to go we can the, say ourselves. We can say ourselves. We can say like uh, I can do this. I am talking to Krishna. Uh-huh. This that. But uh-huh. uh, it may be momentarily. But uh, may Lord wants to give that uh, what is that? Uh, this will happens if you practice sincerely. But it will never continue because uh, time by time it is changing. The situations are changing. Gunas, living entities are bounded by the gunas, so they 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 won't react all the time as saint in sattva. Only guru can be in the sattva state every time, and he will. Connect us. That is the one. We cannot say that I I hear this from Krishna. I he told me this. He told me that. Uh-huh. Okay, so that one. Sometimes even the other way around, they say that um, they speaking to God directly. There are also people who say that they can communicate uh, with with God directly. They are speaking directly. But then we are told in Krishna consciousness that we have to go through a servant of a servant of a servant, like that. And then. Uh, But uh, authorized disciplic succession people, nobody say that Krishna told this to me like that. Uh-huh. Uh, they are they are all who is uh, leading some uh, uh, profit based organizations or something. They may only tell that uh, Krishna told this. I will deliver you from this. This uh, medicinal cure, this that, so many organizations are there, which may tell that if you uh, hear this, you will get that, you will get. That. But all of our uh, authorized sampradayas are telling that if you follow the instructions of guru, then you will be getting the uh, mercy of the law. That's the one. Yeah, that's right. Mercy of the law. Mata Ji and Prabhu, I have one question. So, does uh-huh. Guru Nanak be a human, or it can be a Shastra? Also, can be a Guru. Uh, I think we still need the Guru's interpretation. Sometimes, when we are reading some uh, the Shastra and the translation, <laughs> sometimes there is a, there is some differences between the. Uh, the the various translations sometimes you no know, like we see like we we do we do see uh, Vishnu Vishwanatha Chakravarti's uh, translations in uh, Baladev Vidya Bhushana's translations also so there are some differences there some slight differences not to say a very big difference so we need the guru to actually interpret it for us. that's why Chila Prabhupada's thoughts are very very long although we said if somebody wants to. Once I heard somebody say a statement, you make a statement, you know, saying that uh, we only need to read the translations. It's Jeffrey Armstrong. I was just listening to a video of him because I've read the, the book he wrote on karma, and I'm trying to figure out is he a Hare Krishna devotee or not because he's taken a lot of ideas from Sri Ram Prabhupada. So he made a very strong statement in the video, you know, by saying that one. Because he's come up with his own Bhagavad Gita, the the Bhagavad Gita come to life. He's come up with his own Bhagavad Gita. So there he mentioned that uh, one only need to look at the translations. Do not look at the purports. So we he says like that. Do not look at the purports. So we just look at the translation. We are not scholars of Sanskrit. How we can make sense of the translation alone? We need the guru to uh, very explicitly bring out. The points, like even with Chila Prabhupada's purports, we are already struggling to understand the purports. Also, although the Chila Prabhupada is written in very clear English and everything is very, is uh, very, very um, fine there, very well explained, but we still need guidance. I think we need, we need the guidance. 
So we can't say that we do not need the, the, the guru for guidance. No, no, no. I'm not saying, Mataji, we do not need the guru. But uh-huh. the guru has to be a human or it can be a shastras also. For most of the people, yes, I understand that we need to, without the guru, we can't even. He is the one who is giving us the qualification. But my question is like, you know, there are some people in our, like Jagannath Das Babaji, we don't know who is his guru, right? Uh-huh. So maybe there are some, there are some souls which were, were very uh, advanced and um, yeah. they just come to this uh, planet for um, because of some uh, service of the God and then they just go back. Uh-huh. So for those people, maybe we don't need, uh, they don't need a guru because they're directly connected. They are not Nitya uh, Bhattas, you know? Yes. Yes, I think. Yeah, if, if, yeah, if, you're, if you're speaking about a highly enlightened souls, rare souls, yeah. Yeah, rare souls, like that, yeah. But, the, but your question of whether, whether we, we, the Guru needs to be human, I, I would say the Guru need, needs to be human. I think... Uh, Otherwise, it will become rhythmic, rhythmic philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yeah. Which is a uh, deviation uh, from mainstream. Nowhere it's um, actually Ekalavya uh, uh, accepted like that means he didn't take uh, his spiritual master Dronacharya uh, directly. He just imagined, okay, he's my spiritual master. I mean, so to remove that deviation, to come in the society of Lee Krishna arranged Dronacharya to give him a small punishment by cutting off his finger. Mm. Otherwise, the society might take up that kind of uh, deviation mm. by accepting Ritvik. They will imagine, okay, he is my guru, but actually, guru is not there in human form anymore. Mm-hmm. So that is the reason to set the right example for the situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we should have a human guru. We should. Yeah, I, I I would like to Hari Krishna. I, you know, I've been listening to the conversation, and I would like to say that uh, the guru, the guru. We say there are three authorities. We say sadhu, shastra, and guru. So that it's not that the Shastra is a guru, but Shastra is one authority. But it should be, whatever opinions are presented from the Shastra, they have to be supported by Sadhu and Guru. Then you see, we, we have three authorities and they should, they should agree. If, if they don't agree, then something is wrong. Mm. So sh- there has to be. You can't just have the sh- the shastra and no guru. If you just uh-huh. have shastra on your own, because there are so many interpretations of shastra. Now, now you can have Bhagav just like uh, one devotee that they were reading Bhagavad Gita, and it was a Mayavadi translation, and they had the translation, and it was exactly the same as our translation, and. So th- then what is the difference? Well, the difference is in the purport. When you read the purport, then you see the difference. But the translation of the verse could be the same. So the person who is saying, just read the verse and don't read the purport, that's not right either. You have to hear, you have to hear the purport. If you just read the verse, you never understand what is the actual meaning. Now, so many Mayavadis, they also comment on Bhagavad Gita, but their understanding of Bhagavad Gita is not like ours. You know, they're talking about merging and becoming one with Krishna and so, so many things. So we have to hear from also the Guru, along with the sadhus, the holy men, the authorities. And then you have to... We have to understand what is the proper conclusion. So three authorities are there: Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru. And they, they should be. We should check to make sure they all agree. So Maharaj, one small question: so What is the difference between a Sadhu and Guru? Well, Guru is the person who you have a personal relationship with. 
And that is the person who's giving you direct instruction. Who you uh, you've taken shelter of him, and he's helping you to go back to Godhead. The sadhus are the people who, you know, they 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 taught, they they preached, but they may they may not preach to you personally. You don't you never personally met them, or, but you heard about them. You know them. Oh, a sadhu could be people who they, you you. It could be people you know, but you never took initiation from them. You didn't really uh, surrender to them. You don't take regular instruction for them, but you res respect them as a spiritual. Recording in progress. Uh oh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, are we all back in the main group? Yeah, are the groups all closed? Yeah, Maharaj, I think so because I see all the participants. Everyone's back? Let me see. Yes, Maharaj, most of us. Two, three are. Is everyone there? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Well, I didn't know you were closing the group. You, you didn't tell me. You didn't give us any warning. There was one minute. Okay, Maharaj. From next time, I will send you a message. Yeah, you, you, you have to tell me beforehand. You have to send a message. So I was in the middle of talking to devotees. Okay. Maharaj, we had one minute warning. So that was it. Really? I didn't get it. I don't know. It I was on the screen. It From was on the screen. Message. Oh, it came on the screen, did it? Yeah. Yes. From next time, I'll send you a message. All right, so uh, so everyone's back. Let's have a look at the first question. I believe that by helping people in distress, one can always be in communion with God, for God always cares for those in need. So who would like to offer their answer for this? Group number what? Group number one? How do you respond to this? Krishna Maharaj. So uh, here, um, essentially if someone is in distress, then let's say someone is hungry or something, then even if we supply food, that is a temporary solution, that is not permanent. So this kind of material uh, uh, supplement is kind of not, temp not temporary, not permanent. Also, uh, also like Yashmin Tushya Yad Krishna, if we, instead of that, if we try to satisfy Krishna by serving him, then automatically everyone will be pleased. Uh, like, which is uh, essentially similar to like watering the root. So if we water the root of the tree, then essentially all the branches and leaves, everything are already satisfied. That, that is, there are a few points. And also like uh, Prabhupada, uh, many times he mentioned in his purports and lectures that ultimately, the most, the highest welfare activity is preaching Krishna consciousness because that is the permanent thing and that can make everyone happy. So, yeah, instead of instead of trying to satisfy them materially, we can uh, preach Krishna consciousness, we can try to make them God conscious so that they can come out of the distress. You can make people God conscious, you get them out of distress. You, well, they'll still be hungry. You didn't satisfy their, they're starving. You know, you can't just preach to people about God consciousness when they're starving. And, at the same time, we can distribute prasadam, like we can, uh, like getting prasadam, that will also satisfy their hunger as well as, uh, that will uplift them spiritually. They will get a mercy out of prasadam. 
Well, it may be other kinds of, they may be homeless. They may be living in the, in the street with no place to go. But Maharaj, if they, if they become Krishna conscious, uh, if they develop that faith in Krishna, then they will be completely dependent on Krishna. And in this, this verse, Krishna says um, that if someone is completely devoted in, in service of him, then Krishna gives him that intelligence so that he can progress. So if the, we can make that person like a, a true devotee, like make him completely dependent on Krishna for all the situations, well, I, th and, I think and, and, and I think it will be service. very difficult to make him a devotee when he's in that in such distress. You have a very I mean you can talk about making him a devotee, but I think it would be very unlikely that you could make anyone a devotee when they're in that kind of distress. I haven't found it. I, you know, I'm, in this situation, I don't find it's very easy. To, it's easy to make people devotees neck. When they're still trying to solve their basic needs, then it's very difficult to take them, to, to make them devotees. Maharaj, maybe we can, uh, for the time being, we can support them whatever they need and also at the same time engage them in different kinds of services. Just in the temple or something, but by doing the service they will get um, some positive, first of all, some mercy of Krishna as well as some positive feedback out of that. Okay, now you're becoming like a social welfare <laughs> institution. We're going to take all the homeless people and give them work in the temple, bring them to the temple. Uh, Anyway, we, we, we want to look at that, what is, the, uh, what is the philosophy which is being presented here? And, and what, what is wrong with the philosophy which is being presented here? You know, don't, I'm, not, I'm not just looking for some alternative. I, I want to know what is actually the fault in this philosophy which is being presented here. So here it, here it seems that by serving, the distress of serving in general, in general mass, they think they are serving God or they can get the favor of God, which is not true. Maybe like the, the other way is true. If we serve the God, then we are serving everyone. Then. Well, it, it's certainly a pious activity, you know, to do welfare activities to help others is certainly pious. You know, could, we could say it's, there's some piety there. Would someone else like to offer their response on this? Do you pick up my, what I want? I'm looking for something dealing with the philosophy based on our understanding and Krishna, what's Krishna speaking about in the Bhagavad Gita? Krishna said, I, uh, to those who are constantly devoted to me and worship, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. And here the man is saying, we help the people in the, who are poor, they can, they'll always be, when we can always be in communion with God. So this, the man is saying, by helping the people in distress, we're going to be in communion with God. And he argues, God always cares for those in need. So he's arguing that we're doing God's work by caring for those in need. Is there anything wrong with this philosophy? Hare Krishna Maharaj, so yes. this, is, this is person, uh, so what we discussed that the person who is uh, uh, trying to do the uh, purpose of God is like ways of uh, God. So we, uh, so we, we, we are like communist or socialistic philosophy who want to take the responsibility of God. So, so those people are in competitions of God, so that means they are, they are envious of God. 
while the whole creation has been created by the God himself. So as uh, uh, we see in Isho Prishad also, so that everybody's uh, uh, part and parcels are demarcated and one should not consume more than what it is demarcated uh, to him. So here also Lord says that everything has, has been created by the God and God is the, uh, Krishna is the ultimate source. So if anybody is suffering, it is all because of his past karma. And if he try to reduce his karma, then the thing is he has he has to uh, suffer uh, uh, incessantly uh, because uh, he uh, in, in life and death cycle. So ultimately, uh, it's instead of finding the temporary solutions, uh, 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 Krishna consciousness we can mold them that he should look for a permanent solutions. And if he surrendered to uh, Krishna, then uh, uh, all his past karmas will be taken care of, and at the same time. Uh, he, he can uh, get the uh, ultimate bliss and as far as this temporary suffering is, is concerned um, uh, so uh, if he required to surrender to the Lord then only this temporary suffering can be over because by temporarily providing them food or shelter it is not going to solve them permanently or try to make them a Krishna conscious which is, which is the ultimate aim of our, our society. Okay, yes, uh, certainly some, there's some good points here. I agree that people are suffering, it's their karma, you know, that we could say that here, the philosophy which is being presented here is that God always cares for those in need. Well, God, you know, they're in need, what, what, what their, their needs are not going to solve their problem because the problem is their karma, right? Krishna Maharaj, yeah, yeah. I would also, also like to try. Yes. So I present group number three Maharaj, so what we discussed uh, <clears throat> was that I mean, what the person is trying to do, let's say if someone is helping people in distress and he thinks that he can achieve God. So what he's trying to do is, uh, on the strength of the material service, right, because there is nothing, trans no transcendence here, uh, someone is trying to achieve God. So that is, uh, you know, that is against 10.10. Had it been the case that someone is actually serving the Lord, right, because in the first case there is no service to the Lord. <laughs> let's reverse the case. Someone is distributing prasadam. So in that way, he's doing service to the Lord. Someone is distributing harinam along with the prasadam. Right? So that also, again, he is uh, doing service to the Lord. So if someone does constant service to the Lord, then only God gives. Now, it is the prerogative of the God, of the Lord, uh, whether to, to give this understanding or not. Who is eligible to get that understanding and who is not? So that is the prerogative of the Lord Krishna to whom to give this understanding. So if someone thinks that by doing any sort of material activity, one can attain that understanding, uh, which is the prerogative of the Lord to give, so probably one cannot achieve that. This is, uh, I mean, one understanding, Maharaj. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would suggest that uh, we would consider everyone to be in distress in the material world. That it's not just a question of who is suffering from homelessness or food hunger or some medical health problem, but everyone in the material world has a material body. Whether they're rich or poor, whether they're fed or not, they're in distress because it's the nature of the material world. So we want to help everyone. We try to offer help to everyone. We can always be in communion, we can be in communion with God when we see God in the hearts of everyone. You know, we shouldn't be, we were, last week we were talking about Mahatma Gandhi, he was concerned for the, the, the people in the Bangi colony. The Hari, he created the Harijan. So he, he, he was just concerned for one group of people. But 
we want to consider helping everyone because everyone's in distress, they have the material body. So this is our point. That yes, pe some people are in need of material, they have material needs, we agree. And these material needs, they have to be met. It's not really the business of our Krishna consciousness movement to, to satisfy these needs. That just becomes a social welfare institution. And that's not really what Krishna, Krishna consciousness is, a spiritual movement. And so we want to help everyone. When there was a famine, in the times of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, there was a famine, and they asked him to contribute for the famine. For the, he said, no. He said, that's not my business. He said, We're, I'm, I'm head of a spiritual organization. We don't do that kind of work. Okay. Yes? yes? One more point, Maharaj. God will help those who help themselves is one of the point. Okay. Yes? Uh, so, in that aspect, if we engage them, uh, the, ask the person always to engage in any little service to Krishna, then God will give knowledge yeah. and make them to out of stress. Okay, yes, God helps, God helps those who help themselves, then Prabhupada added, so if they want to help themselves, they should surrender to Krishna. Sri Krishna Maharaj, so one more point, that uh, what about the material distress which is people are suffering because of lack of homelessness or food, this is all a, a mental state, like our Goswami, they, they, they also, they, they, they didn't have any home or something like that, any material possession, but they were the happiest person was because they are totally surrendered to the Lord. So what, and, and even somebody is very rich, he has got all the wealth, but still he is suffering, as you rightly said, that uh, uh, everybody is suffering, whether it is of lack of material wealth or they have a plenty of material wealth, because this is mostly a mental state, because they is not surrendered to the Lord. So, in any case and every uh, case, a person is stressed. Uh, 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 stressed. So unless we surrender to the Lord and understand the true meaning of life, uh, we cannot get happiness and contentment. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, let's go ahead. The second question. By studying and analyzing various literature, I am in constant communion with God. What is the necessity of service or devotion when he is beyond the senses? Let's hear from group number five. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So, there are uh, three authorities as uh, we discussed in the group, uh, as you were also joining at that time. Shadu, Sastra and Guru. So, there are, these are the three authorities. And uh, Sadhu and Sastra will always be in line with the Sadhu and the Guru always are in line with the Shastras and they both should uh, uh, not deviate from their uh, path of instructions and if one follow even the path of uh, Shastra, they will get the association of this, they must get the association of the Sadhu and Guru. So even though it is, uh, someone is beyond uh, the vision of uh, Lord, they cannot uh, like uh, do the things by themselves. One has to uh, hear the instructions from gurus and the shastras. Hare Krishna. Okay. Yes. Someone else like to take up on this this question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So first of all, when you say the literature, so any literature cannot be authentic literature until unless the literature which is the Shastra which is being given by the, uh, the Lord himself because when uh, the, uh, the, the, the persons wanted to enjoy so when the Lord has created this material uh, material creation has been created by God he has given the whole manual so any literature is not the authentic so first of all we have to listen to the authentic literature now even this authentic Shastra when you have left 
referring we cannot understand it by uh, understanding the worldly meaning of it so we have to uh, understand it in in uh, guru shishya parampara and discipline uh, succession then only we can understand the true uh, meaning of that and 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 and, and, uh, and here also say that necessary services when he is beyond the senses now that, that means that we are uh, talking about that uh, 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 we are questioning the basic presence of god that until unless he is achievable with this material senses which is itself uh, uh, contaminated and incomplete so with that we cannot able to uh, achieve or, or uh, see see the god with our uh, limited uh, 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 this contaminated senses so uh, so here the whole philosophy is this anybody who is trying to uh, uh, go through this concocted literature which does not understand the give the true meaning of the uh, lord which this literature is created by the man and then with our faulty senses we are trying to achieve the god for them it is the god is totally unconceivable so that is what probably we can understand from it Maharaj. Yes, thank you Prabhu. I'm glad you brought that point up about literature. Yes, literatures have to be authorized. Right? There's a verse, Shruti Smriti Puranadi Pancharatriki Vidimbinam Haikantiki Hariya Bhakti Rudpatayai Vakaupate. That any devotional service which is not supported by the, the Shruti, the Smriti, the Puranas, the Pancharatriki, and then it's simply a disturbance to society. So it shouldn't just be any literature, but there must be authorized literature. There must come from proper authorities, authoritative sources. What about the second point though, the necessity of service or devotion when he is beyond the senses? What is the necessity of service of devo or devotion when he is beyond the senses? How did you deal with this again, Prabhu? What was your answer? Can I, can I try to manage? Yes, please, Maharaj, go ahead. Please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. So, from, what, from, from, from my own part, from my own uh, personal experiences uh, dealing with people before I came to Krishna consciousness, I can say that number one and number two are kind of linked also because uh, the, the philosophy underlying, I'll go to number two first, the philosophy underlying number two is, is like as if the Lord doesn't, uh, the, the God does not, is beyond the senses. But we are told in Gaudiya Vaishnavism here that we need to please the senses of the Lord. We need to give pleasure to Krishna, which is God. So when we say here, what is the necessity of service? So the other philosophies actually, they do not have this conception of devotional service, serving the Lord. For example, like, like uh, for instance, when we serve the Lord, we do deity worship or when we uh, offer our food to the Lord. For them, it's, it is the Lord is beyond the senses. So, what is the necessity of service or devotion? But here in the in the ten point ten, the Lord says that we should serve with love. We, sh we should serve. We should uh, we should be devoted to serving Him with love. Then He will give the understanding by which uh, we can go to Him. And also in number one, I wanted to say something just now. In number one. I'm very familiar with this number one especially and also number two. Number one is usually, uh, I'm sorry to say that it's usually spoken by people of other religions who who always feel that uh, God cares for those in need in, in, in the sense that I have, I have used to have a friend who used to tell me uh, there's nothing that will please God more than uh, helping people who are downtrodden, distressed, uh, who live in dilapidated homes and do not have hands and legs or are blind, there's nothing which will please God more than caring for such people. So she was big on charity in that sense. So I used to, to think a little bit like that until I came to Krishna consciousness and here I see our philosophy is very different because these things are, are God is aloof of those things because those things as the Prabhu mentioned just now, Dhananjaya Prabhu mentioned just now about uh, these things being karmic reactions their desire and karma put them in that in that sort of a, a situation. And also as Guru Maharaj mentioned mentioned just now, we can't talk tatua to them when, when they are in uh, abject poverty, for instance. 
So they are not in any position to understand uh, anything to do with, uh, with, with God, let alone devotional service. So like that, I feel that these philosophies, number one and number two, actually philosophies which are not of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Uh, number number two can be said to be a philosophy that even within mainstream Hinduism also they will think like that. Uh, what is what is this service? Service to God? Because they cannot understand that God is a person and we are pleasing God who is a person and we are trying to build a personal relationship with God. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Okay, thank you, Sri Devi. Yes, we're dealing with God and He's a person. So, He's beyond the senses. He described what is, what is the necessity of service and devotion. Yes, He's beyond the senses, but when, when we use our senses, our senses with serve, in the mood of service and devotion, then He can reveal Himself to us. We have to understand the nature of the Lord that the Lord describes Himself, how He is pleased by loving devotion. So they're saying, what is the necessity of service and devotion? But the Lord says, that's what He wants. He wants devotion. He says he, He's only understood by devotion. Only by devotion can it be understood. And then this person doesn't know anything about God. He's talking about God, but he doesn't know anything. So, we have to understand everything on the basis of the, the Word of God Himself, Bhagavad Gita. Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to guide us so that we could understand Him. And he, He's describing how we can approach Him by service and devotion. And this rascal is saying, what is the necessity? What does he know? He doesn't know anything, just speaking nonsense, his own, his, own, his own judgments. But Lord Krishna himself has already said that he is very pleased by devotion. Okay, the last one. Some people say that God speaks to them directly, therefore they do not need any guru for guidance. Who would like to take this one up? Who hasn't spoken? like a chance to speak. Please. Lalita, you can speak. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Mm. So, uh, we, we find in Srimad Bhagavatam that uh, God himself came in this age of Kali as Lord Chaitanya and um, he himself, although he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, uh, he shows by his personal example by accepting a spiritual master. So what qualification do rest of the people have to say that they do not need a guru for guidance? Okay, so that's one argument that Lord Chaitanya comes, he's Krishna himself, but he comes and he takes a spiritual master. What about Krishna? Did Krishna have a spiritual master? Yes. Sandipani Yes, right. What about Lord Ramachandra? Did Lord Ramachandra have a guru? Yes, Vishwamitra Muni. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, Vashishta Muni, I think. Yeah, okay. Vashishta, Vishwamitra, they were both giving guidance yeah. to Lord Ramachandra. Yes? Uh, and also in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna himself says uh, to learn the truth by approaching a self-realized soul, render service unto him and inquire from him submissively. Well, what if, but I could say, well, God is my guru. God is speaking to me directly. So do I still need to have a guru? I mean, if God is speaking to me directly, what is the need? Um, that could be a mental concoction. So, uh, 
uh, in order to confirm whether God is actually speaking to you and you are not mentally speculating, you need to ask from Guru whether that is correct. Okay. Who is already a self-realized soul. Yes. And uh, Maharaj, I also remember a pastime from South in, uh, some, some temple in South India, which I cannot remember where, and a devotee. Uh, his name also I don't remember. I think it uh, starts with K. His name starts with K. And uh, he was serving the Lord in the temple directly. A very pure, elevated soul. And uh, he used to daily converse with the Lord. The Lord in the deity form used to talk to him and tell. they both used to talk about everything in that uh, uh, town. Uh, who got married, who, uh, who had a child. They used to talk everything together like friends. And one day this devotee just casually asked Krishna, um, when will I come back to your... Uh, no, uh, I think one person told this devotee to ask the Lord, uh, when will he come back? So the devotee told, tell him that he will come back very, very soon. Then he to, uh, this devotee asked, uh, can I ask you when will I reach your abode? So he told after 10 more lifetimes. Then he was shocked. Uh, he told, Krishna, I am already directly talking to you. Uh, how can you say like this? What more do I need to do? So he told, the problem is you are very pure hearted. You are doing everything to me. You are serving me. But uh, you are approaching me directly. You haven't accepted a spiritual master. Uh, if you do that, that one more service, one more step, then you become completely qualified. So immediately he goes, um, already he is famous in this village to be a pure devotee. So nobody wanted to accept him as his disciple. So he disguises himself as a low class person and goes to a, another pure devotee's house and accepts um, menial service in that house and serves that pure devotee as his servant. Krishna and he comes back and Krishna says, now we are qualified. Okay, thank you very much. Ma Maharaj, I just wanted to clarify one thing, like during our group discussion, one of my friends was saying that uh, Jagannath Das Babaji was a pure devotee. So such pure devotees may not require a spiritual master. So I just looked at Srila Prabhupada's Parpat and an another Gaudiya Man in Google and it says that Jagannath Das Babaji had a spiritual master. Um, yes, certainly. Krishna. Certainly I had a spiritual master. I heard him say that also. I, uh, it, it's not correct. He said Jagannath Das... He, well, he said he didn't know who was his spiritual master. Okay. He didn't okay. say that he didn't have a spirit, but he said he, he said we don't know who was the spiritual master. But certainly Jagannath Das Babaji did have a spiritual master. He was yeah. he was initiated. Yeah, it shows here that uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur was his Shiksha spiritual master, uh, who comes in the line of Baladev Vidya Bhushan and. Uh, Madhusudan Das Babaji of Govardhan was his Diksha spiritual master. Okay. Yeah. So he had Diksha Guru and Shiksha Gurus. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, sir. So normally the Sahaji of, uh, of uh, Brindavan, they always pretend that they are uh, uh, directly talking to Krishna and, and they don't follow any rituals and uh, any condition. But, but uh, 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 Prabhupada says that one should be very cautious about uh, uh, coming across and getting uh, fooled by the Sahajiyas. Oh yeah, definitely. 
want to be very careful about the sahajas. These people, these are the people who say they're talking to Krishna every day, Krishna comes to them and talks to them. So they, they take it so cheaply. So we're not, we're not impressed by these people who talk like that. We have to be careful. Who, do, who does Krishna come and talk to? Those people who are constantly devoted. That's the main point. The, the Krishna doesn't just talk to anyone. It's not so cheap, not so easy thing. It's a very special thing. Krishna come, comes to talk to people. Sri Krishna Maharaj, or, uh, and then Mataji was telling, is it about this uh, Kachi, uh, Kachi Purn, uh, uh, so she, she narrated the story about is it the Kanchi Puram? Yes, right. That I think this, I think that's the story she's talking about. I think it's the Kanchi Puram. Yeah, there was a, from the Ramanuja Sampradaya. There was one yeah. of the devotees there. He used to talk to the deity. Uh, yes, I, I, I think it is the name is Kanchi Puram. I think. Uh -huh. Okay. So, let's see, we'll go ahead here. Here's another quote here, would someone please read for us? Prabhupada, there is one common philosophy held by a lot of religious groups that God can be understood directly from within and that no guru is necessary. He is a rascal and one who accepts him is a rascal. How do you think that God is speaking to him? How do you accept it? God talks with whom? So those who have already become devotee of the God and engaged in his service, he talks with them, not a third class fool. One who is engaged in the service of the Lord 24 hours a day with love and faith, God talks with him. When one follows instructions of the Guru, Krishna will give intelligence. Okay. So when we follow the instructions of the Guru, Krishna will give intelligence. This is what, this is the point. And the, and the person is saying, oh, you, you don't need a guru. And so then what do you, how do you, how do you know what to do? If you don't have any guru, what are you going to do? Who's going to guide you? You're just going to, you're going to talk about God. You don't know anything about God. You don't have a guru. You don't hear anything. And God's going to come and talk to you? It's, it's all nonsense. So, those people who are actually genuine, they will take instructions from the spiritual teachers and then they will be blessed by Lord Krishna. Krishna will give them the intelligence so that they can understand better. As we heard, you may be a member of a spiritual society, you may be initiated, but we may not be intelligent enough to understand how to advance. Then Krishna will give the intelligence to help us. Right? Somehow maybe the Guru didn't do it, he gave the instructions, but we're not so intelligent, then Krishna personally will guide the devotee. Krishna helps. Yes, someone can read this quote statement here. In conclusion, if a disciple is very serious to execute the mission of the spiritual master, he immediately associates with the Supreme Personality of Godhead by Vani or Babu. This is the only secret of success in seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Instead of being eager to see the Lord in some bush in Vrindavana, while at the same time engaging in sense gratification, if one instead sticks to the principle of following the words of the spiritual master, he will see the Supreme Lord without difficulty. Real intelligence means linking with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When this is done, the Supreme Personality of Godhead from within gives on the real intelligence by which one can return home back to Godhead. Thank you. So Prabhupada's instruction here, very important. You have to get the the words of the spiritual master. And when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada also writes there that, he said, 
if we study the Srimad Bhagavatam very seriously, we will see Krishna in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Lord will appear to us in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. That is the power of the, the scriptures. Of course, because the scriptures are the words of the spiritual master. So when we read the scriptures very seriously, we, one day we will actually see Krishna in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. All right? But we can also see Krishna through following the words of the spiritual master. Very important. So Prabhupada was always remembering the words of his spiritual master, his instructions, you know, to go and preach and to print books whenever you get money, print books like that. And so Prabhupada was always thinking of his spiritual master. In this way he was getting Krishna's association. Krishna was with him, helping him. All right, someone please read this one. Eagerness as qualification. God wants to see how eager you are. So in the development of our eagerness and sincerity to have knowledge in spiritual understanding, God will help us. Laulyam, eagerness, that is the price. That is the only qualification. You must be very, very eager to see the lotus feet of Krishna in this very life. You must be very eager to talk with Krishna in this very life, but not to become sahajya by service. Krishna talks with the devotee, but not with the non-devotee. He says in the Bhagavad Gita, Tesham Satata Yukta Nam Bhajatam Priti Purvaka. Only persons who are always engaged in Krishna's service. He has no other business. Satata means 24 hours. Bhajatam means in service. Mm. So, Loyam. This is the price, right? Krishna Bhakti Bhavatir Kriya Dham Yato 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 Tri Labhyate Tatra Loya Mapi Muya Mekalam Janma Koti Sukritir Nalabhyate This is the verse which Prabhupada got the phrase Krishna Consciousness from. said so there's only one price by which we can purchase Krishna Consciousness. And the price is that we should have this loyam. Here it's translated as eagerness. Sometimes it's translated as intense greed or intense desire to achieve it. So that eagerness is very essential. That we must be, as Prabhupada says here, you must be very eager to talk to Krishna in this way. But we should be eager for, for service, not to just, oh, I want to talk to Krishna. We shouldn't want to trouble Krishna unnecessarily. We should think, who am I that Krishna has to come and talk to me? First, we, should, we have to become humble servants. Krishna talks with the devotee, not with the non-devotee. So only people who are fully engaged, then Krishna is attracted by their service. But one who is fully engaged in devotional service, he's, he, he's already communicating with Krishna through his service. And he, he doesn't need Krishna to come and talk to him. He's always, because he's always thinking of Krishna, so he sees Krishna everywhere. So that is the mood of the pure devotee. We simply want to give service to Krishna. We don't want to trouble Krishna, oh Krishna should come and talk to me. It's not really, it's not really the goal. We want to just simply give service to Krishna. Anyway, that eagerness is there, eager to see the lotus feet of Krishna. Okay, the lotus feet of Krishna comes in the form of service to Krishna. All right, someone can read this. You must always find some opportunity to render service to Krishna. That is the qualification. It doesn't matter what you are. 
you may be this or that it doesn't but this eagerness for service can be acquired by anyone simply by sincerity that is the price rupa goswami says tatra lamyam ekalam mutyam mm. so i have to i have too much eagerness but no immediately stri stri rupa goswami उटी All right so that's this is the verse proper's quoting this verse by Rupa Goswami there's only one price right muyam ekalam muyam one price and that price is that that we have a very intense desire this eagerness for service and this is our price the price of our sincerity and this is how we can actually get krishna conscious a krishna consciousness e eagerness to achieve krishna's mercy to approach the lotus feet of krishna that is krishna's mercy devotional service by devotional service we see krishna we see krishna in the form of service krishna is everywhere in everything so the devote feels the presence of krishna in every in everything he does that i'm doing this for krishna's pleasure this is my service for krishna so we have to have that kind of determination and prabhu but said not easy the gopis they had that determination they were always krishna conscious always chanting krishna's names didn't matter what they were doing they were always chanting the names of krishna and singing songs about krishna at the same time they're taking care of their babies and they're milking the cows and they're washing clothes and they're cleaning their house and doing so many other chores but they are always chanting the names of krishna they never forget krishna they're always doing kirtan although they're doing so many other duties too So that is the real piety and that is how you can approach Krishna the more we are really absorbed in Krishna in service to Krishna so that eagerness for service it's very important Rupa Goswami describes six qualifications for advancing the first one utsahan enthusiasm so that enthusiasm that eagerness it's very important some people not very eager so we did 10 10 here's 10 11 both of these verses 10 10 and 10 11 are describing prayojana they are describing the stage of love of god knowledge at the stage of love of god prayojana gyan the the perfection the, the result of the process of devotional service and the result is like this in the script text 11 to to show them special mercy i dwelling in their hearts destroy with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness born of ignorance all right so tesham evanu kampartam aham agyana jamtama nashayami atma bhavasto gyana dipena bashvata So Gyana Dipena, the light of knowledge. With the light of knowledge, Lord Krishna destroys the darkness born of ignorance. Aham Agyana Jam Tamaha, ignorance. I destroy the to show special mercy. Tesham Evanu Kampartam, Anu Kampartam, the special mercy. so we all want special mercy <laughs> we all expect special mercy so who gets that special mercy krishna said to show them 
Who are them? Who are they? Who does Krishna show special mercy to? Anybody can answer? Praise and love to God Maharaj. Huh? Maharaj, who are in constant, who do constant devotional service to the Lord. Right, right. As yeah. spoken in 10.10. Yeah, from text 10.10. To those who are constantly devoted. So Krishna is continuing to show them, who, those who are constantly devoted, to show them special mercy. I destroy the darkness of ignorance with the lamp of knowledge. So this is prayojana, this is the goal we want to achieve. So these are the four verses which make up the nutshell verses. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, These famous four verses which have been narrated are the essence of all topics in the Gita, removing the misery and producing complete joy for the jivas. So, very important verses. We want to memorize these ones, quote them, often quoted, and we should be able to explain them also. So, removing the misery and producing joy for the jivas. Yeah, we should be joyful when we hear about Krishna how he's reciprocating with the devotees. Yes, from the purport, someone read? Only by devotional service is the supreme truth, Krishna pleased, and by his inconceivable energy, he can reveal himself to the heart of the pure devotee. The pure devotee always has Krishna within his heart, and with the presence of Krishna, who is just like the sun, the darkness of ignorance is at once dissipated. This is the special mercy rendered to the pure devotee by Krishna. Bhagavad Gita 10.11. Yes. So Prabhupada makes the point, only by devotional service is Krishna pleased. And then by Krishna's inconceivable energy, he can reveal himself. He can reveal himself to the heart. Krishna is in the heart. Krishna is everywhere. So he can appear anywhere by his inconceivable energy. He can reveal himself. He doesn't have to go anywhere. He's already everywhere. He's omnipresent. And he can reveal himself through his achintya shakti, his inconceivable energy. So as devotees, we want to understand these kind of features of Lord Krishna, that Lord Krishna has this achintya shakti, inconceivable energy, and he can use this achintya shakti to reveal himself to his devotees anywhere, anytime. He's there with them. And we want to also understand the special nature of devotional service. The, the Lord is pleased when the devotees render service to Him. And because the devotees are serving Him, the devotees are in Krishna's heart. And Krishna is always in the heart of the pure devotees, of course. It's a reciprocation between the Lord and His devotees. The Lord keeps His pure devotees in His heart, and the pure devotees, they keep Krishna in their heart. So this is the special reciprocation between the Lord and His devotees. And Prabhupada, is, this particular verse is saying how Krishna enlightens the heart of His pure devotees. He gives special knowledge by which they can come to Him. Out of, yes, Prabhu. So this for uh, Krishna, it is said that uh, from Dhyan Yoga, the Krishna reveals himself in the heart. But for when we are in Bhakti Yoga, does it mean that Krishna first reveals in his in the devotee's mind 
as we have seen in case of uh, Vashudev and Devaki. So uh, first Krishna appeared in his mind and from there he came to the heart and from there it has been transferred to the heart of uh, Devaki and from there he descended into the womb. So is that the uh, understanding correct, Maharaj? About the birth of Krishna? Yes, Maharaj. So uh, normally through Dhyan Yoga, uh, uh, the Krishna reveals uh, uh, in the person heart momentarily, but uh, for a devotee, Daji reveals first in the mind and where he is always there and to which one can converse. And, and well, it's a question of what kind of knowledge the person has. The goal of knowledge, the perfect knowledge, is to understand that Krishna or Vasudeva is everything. So that's the perfection of their knowledge. If they're simply jnana yogis and cultivating jnana without coming to the conclusion that Vasudeva Krishna is everything, then the knowledge is not perfect. They're not going to get any real realization. They're not going to come to the conclusion of knowledge. They haven't understood the real conclusion of knowledge. So their knowledge is imperfect. So it will be very doubtful what kind of benefit they will get. They may come back in the material world. They may simply be mayavadis or impersonalists. Right? But if their knowledge is, per is complete, then they understand Vasudeva Krishna is everything and they surrender to Krishna. So the perfection of knowledge is when they take up devotional service. Jnanis, what will they understand? They will simply understand Brahman. They will think Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, that's Shankaracharya. You know, everything is Brahman, God is everything, we're all God, we're everything. They don't make any distinction. So that's their limited knowledge. They don't have complete knowledge. Right? Yes. Uh, oh, okay, here's another quote. Someone could read this, please. If he surrenders only to Krishna, he acquires all the knowledge. So similarly, if any person without any knowledge, if he surrenders only to Krishna, he acquires all the knowledge. He has surpassed all stages, and that is also confirmed. If you say how he has gone surpassed all stages, that answer in Bhagavad Gita you find, Tesham eva anukampartham aham agyan jamatama nashyame atma bhavastho gyan dipena bhasvata Tesham, because he is a devotee, just to give, just to show him a special favor. Tesham evanu kampartham, simply for showing a special favor, I myself, from within, I light up the knowledge. And you will be surprised that my Guru Maharaj's spiritual master was Gaur Kishor Das Babaji Maharaj. He was completely illiterate. He did not know how to sign. And my spiritual master was the most learned man of his age. He accepted that guru who was completely illiterate. But but when you when but when he would speak that Gaur Kishor Das Babaji Maharaj, he would speak with all Vedic references. Hmm. All right. So here we have the the evidence to support this statement from the Bhagavad Gita. Right? Lord Krishna is saying, Lord Krishna was saying, out of compassion for them, I, dwelling in their heart, destroy the darkness born of ignorance with the lamp of knowledge. So here you see the knowledge. Gaur Kishore does Babaji Maharaj had no real material education. But it doesn't mean he was illiterate. He was the most educated. And it's stated here, when he would speak, he could quote Vedic references. Now how could he do this? Krishna would give him the intelligence. Krishna from the heart guided him. So this is a very powerful example. 
So if we actually surrender to Krishna, we may not have much knowledge, we may not have much education, but Krishna acts on the heart of his devotee. Prabhupada told us, he said, you can bring anyone to me and I will defeat them. He said, Krishna will tell me how to defeat their arguments. Prabhupada, Krishna from the heart will answer all the questions, all the doubts. So Gorky Shodas Babaji, he's an example that he was illiterate, could not even sign his name, but he could speak very with all references, quoting the Vedic authorities. So this is inconceivable. We cannot understand. But this is a fact. This is the power of the spiritual knowledge, the spiritual potency. It's inconceivable because he surrendered to Krishna. So Krishna revealed everything. And Prabhupada told us also when he would read the Krishna book, he said, you know, I have not written this book. Krishna has written it through me. Right? Do you remember that quote? Prabhupada would hear the Krishna book and he would say, I have not written these books. Krishna has written it through me. So Krishna can do these things. And we saw also, there's an example, Arjunacharya, he was changing the word in the Bhagavad Gita, yoga kshema vahami aham, and he changed it, he changed yoga kshema karomi aham, that I get somebody to do it, I don't do it myself, but I'll get somebody to do it. And Krishna came and proved that he would do it himself. Krishna came. And the, uh, you know, coming to the house of Arjuna Acharya and, and showing that, yes, Krishna said, I, I do it myself. I don't have to get somebody else to do it. I will personally do it. And so he defeated Arjuna Acharya. So we have to understand these points very clearly that Krishna. It's not dependent on anybody else. Krishna himself can do everything because he's everywhere and he's omnipotent. He can do everything himself. All right? Hey, yes? Hey, yes. I have a question. Yes? Have a question here, the question is, Cheto Darpan Marjanam and Gyan Deepen Phaswata, so do they represent the same thing with different analogies or how are they connected, Maharaj? Uh, well, Cheto Dalpan and Marjanam, we're talking about cleansing the mirror of the mind, right? We're cleansing the mirror, all the dust from the mirror from the consciousness. We want to purify the consciousness. But, Tesham uh, Ivanu Kampartam, right? Yeah, Jnana Deepena Basvata. Oh, Jnana Deepena Basvata. So, lightening a lamp or cleaning it, I mean, both of them are representing, uh, getting towards purity. So, uh -huh. I'm taking it like that, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly, some similar, yeah. But, you know, I have to understand, when we say Cheto Darpana Marjanam, this is Lord Chaitanya, he's describing the benediction of the Holy Name. He's particularly talking about the Sankirtan, the chanting of the Holy Name. The Lord Krishna there in that verse, he's talking, he's talking in a more general statement about Bhakti Yoga, devotion in general, to those who are constantly devoted to Krishna. Out of, right? So Krishna's talking about someone who's constantly devoted. But the, the Shikshastikam is speaking about purifying the consciousness, coming to that stage. So, some difference there, you see. Yes, Maharaj. That, that verse in the Bhagavad Gita was describing ones who, who's already pure. They're already in pure consciousness. They're constantly devoted to Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Right? Thank you, Maharaj. 
Thank you, Manaj. Okay. So next section, verses 12 to 18. Arjuna's acceptance and request to hear more of Krishna's opulences. Right? Arjuna had heard Lord Krishna speak the Chatur Sloki. So Arjuna is very inspired hearing Lord Krishna speak the Chatur Sloki. So what's he going to say now after hearing this? So we hear Arjuna talk to Krishna. You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ultimate abode, the purest, the absolute truth. You are the eternal, transcendental, original person, the unborn, the greatest. Like this, Arjuna is really glorifying Lord Krishna, right? He says, Param Brahm, Param Dham, Pavitram, Param Ambam. And then Arjuna goes on and says, All the great sages, such as Narada, Asita, Devala and Vyas, confirm the truth about you. And now you yourself are declaring it to me. So Krishna is declaring it himself. Previously, the sages all said it. Narada, Asita, Devala, Vyas, they were recognizing Krishna's position. Krishna is confirming it by his speaking, the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is confirming. Someone read? It is not that because Krishna is Arjuna's intimate friend, Arjuna is flattering him by calling him the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth. Whatever Arjuna says in these two verses is confirmed by Vedic truth. Vedic injunctions affirm that only one who takes to devotional service to the Supreme Lord can understand Him, whereas others cannot. Each and every word of this verse spoken by Arjuna is confirmed by Vedic injunction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So he's not just trying to flatter Krishna. Prabhupada is confirmed by Vedic injunction. Pose a statement from the purport to text 14. We can understand that scholarship is a waste of time. Discuss and comment. Text 14. Scholarship is a waste of time. Let's look at text number 14. Okay. Krishna says, oh Krishna, Arjuna is saying to Krishna, I totally accept as truth all that you have told me. Neither the demigods nor the demons, O oh Lord, can understand your personality. And then in the purport, Prabhupada talks about, he said, Prabhupada said, he he is not known even by the demigods. So what to speak of the so-called scholars of this modern world? By the grace of the Lord, Arjuna has understood the Supreme Truth is Krishna and that he is the perfect one. One should therefore follow the path of Arjuna. He received the authority of Bhagavad Gita. And then Prabhupada talks about the fourth chapter, and we established the parampara system, it was lost, Krishna has to re-establish it. And Arjuna's qualification, Arjuna is Krishna's friend, he's a devotee. And Gita Upanishad has to be understood in the parampara. Uh, so Arjuna was chosen not because he was a scholar, but because he was a devotee because he was Krishna's friend. So any comments about this? Scholarship is a waste of time. Sri Devi, you're a scholar. You've been a scholar and working in educational circles for many years. What do you think about this? <laughs> Scholarship is very important in an academic institution. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely important. It gives you 
uh, it, 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 just like in, 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 in the spiritual world, we need to take uh, knowledge from authority. So in the academic world, we need to be an authority in our field. We need to be an authority. So we say that scholarship is a waste of time. Then it doesn't apply in all circumstances. It won't uh, apply in an academic institution. <laughs> scholarship is very, very important in an academic institution. It shows you your, uh, your, what you call, uh, your academic merits are based on your scholarship. Yes, Prabhupada encouraged those who had the ability to go into that, to go into the academic field and to um, become Krishna, authorities of Krishna consciousness in the academic circles. His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami was doing that and we have people like Ridayananda Goswami, he did his PhD at I think Harvard University and, and, uh, in Sanskrit. And, Prabhupada, he, he, he thought it would be very good for devotees if they could also get into the academic field and establish Krishna consciousness. And if we have devotees in these kind of positions as professors, as scholars, then they can be recognized. But if we, if we, if we, if we don't have any scholarship, if we don't have any abilities in this field, then people will certainly look down on us. So Krishna consciousness is into everything. We should also be into scholarship. It's not a waste of time, although it may be a waste of time for some people. You have to be qualified, that's the point. Some pe the, for, the proper, for the people who are properly qualified, then they can do the job properly and they can uh, do very nicely. They can write papers about Krishna consciousness movement, the Krishna conscious philosophy, and in this way they can win recognition for the Krishna consciousness movement. Okay? From the purport, text number 16, someone read an important statement here. People in general and the impersonalist in particular concern themselves mainly with the all-pervading nature of the Supreme. So Arjuna is asking Krishna how he exists in his all-pervading aspect through his different energies. Bhagavad Gita 10.16. Right. But this is big bringing up the topic of his vibhutis. You see, Arjuna is going to speak so many of his opulences, or Krishna is going to speak so many of his opulences to Arjuna. So why? Because Arjuna wants to know how he exists in his all-pervading aspect through his different energies. Not everybody can understand the deities. Not everybody can just think of Krishna and the deity in the temple. Not everybody can just uh, take to philosophy. So people in general they, they're more concerned with the all-pervading nature of the Supreme. So, Krishna is all-pervading and Krishna is going to describe his all-pervading aspect. And that's what he does in the Bhagavad Gita. Yes, someone please read. The common man who has no love for Krishna cannot always think of Krishna. Therefore, he has to think materially. Arjuna is considering the mode of thinking of the materialistic persons of this world. The words Keshu, Keshu, Chaba, Bhaveshu refer to material nature. The word Bhava means physical things. Because materialists materialist cannot understand Krishna spiritually, they are advised to concentrate the mind on physical things and try to see how Krishna is manifested by physical representations. Bhagavad Gita 10.17 Yes, right? Arjuna is considering the thinking of the materialistic people. Materialists, they cannot understand Krishna spiritually. So, they have to hear about physical things and try to see Krishna there. Right? This is the point. And then Krishna is now going to describe his opulences. So many opulences, right? 
Now you should know these, you, should, you have to be familiar with these, right? Of immovable things, what is Krishna? Krishna says, of immovable things I am. Nobody know. Himalayas, Maharaj. Yes, right, thank you, the Himalayas, right. And of mountains, I am? Meru. That's right, yes, good. And of seasons? Spring, Maharaj. Spring. Why? Because it is the most opulent, flowery... Uh, yeah, there's the adjective, the, the uh, flower-bearing spring, yes. That's right. You want to give the, the full description, flower-bearing spring, yeah. Of fish I am... The shark, right. And of beasts I am... Of beasts, of beasts I am? Uh, huh? Beast. 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 Yeah. Of beast, B-E-A-S-T, of beast, I am the lion. Lion. Right. Like this, you have to know these things. This will come in your test, I'm sure. When you do the exam, they'll ask you these things. They always do. You have to know some of, you have to know them, so you can quiz each other. Oh no, we're not going to do a poem tonight, no time. Okay, anyway, there's so many vibhutis, you should read them over, be familiar with them. And then Krishna says at the end of it all, he says, Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam srimad urjitam evava tatta deva gajacha tvam mama tejo misha sambhavam. Know that all opulent, beautiful and glorious creations spring from but a, an amsha, mama tejo misha sambhavam, amsha sambhavam, a spark of my splendor. Right? What is that spark? What is that spark of Krishna's splendor? Karana de Kashai Vishnu. Krishna, then Krishna continues to finish the chapter. But what need is there, Arjuna, for all this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire creation. Vistabi aham idam kritsnam ekam shena sthito jagat. Ekam shena sthito jagat. The fragment, what is that fragment of himself? Paramatma. Yes, the Paramatma. So with a single fragment, with the Paramatma, he pervades and supports this entire creation. So in this way Krishna completes the tenth chapter. Mm -hmm. Okay, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. All right, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Maharaj. And we'll be back again, hopefully. We'll get a class on Saturday. <laughs> Didn't get one, missing a few classes, but... My obeisance is to you, Maharaj. All right, my obeisance is to all of you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Go back to Vrinda ki jai.